Welcome to The Details with Elliot Connie and Adam Frower. This is a podcast where we examine the intersection between solution-focused brief therapy and current topics going on in the world. And we do this because we genuinely want the world to be a better place. So enjoy and come examine the details with us. So Adam, I know that for much of the past week, you were away with your beautiful, wonderful family, doing relaxing, beautiful, wonderful family things. But I know you're back now and have seen the news that Donald J. Trump, president of the United States of America, has tested positive for COVID-19 and has experienced at least mild time. If you follow the doctors, uh, what has happened and how they treated it is kind of up in the air. Like you get different reports from different people, but I think it's commonly accepted that he had at least mild symptoms and received at least some sort of a treatment. We know that he spent three days in the hospital, in Walter Reed Hospital to be specific. So um, I wanna walk you through this, Adam, while you were gone and tell you how this was experienced, at least by me. And then there's actually an important lesson about leadership and solution-focused brief therapy wrapped up in the events that have happened over the last few days. But so what happened was I was just kind of living my life and I got a notification on my phone that Donald Trump has tested positive for coronavirus. It was insane. Later on on social media, my entire Facebook wall was just totally responses to that, like just totally insane. And I'll be honest with you, one of my responses was, I'm not sure that it's true. I hate to call anybody an untruth teller, but there's so much weird misinformation being thrown about by the White House. And it just to the point where I don't know what to believe or what not to believe. But I can tell you this. I totally experienced it. And people got really mad about this on social media, like people saying, oh, it's karma and it's this and it's that. Now, I don't know if you call it karma or ironic or whatever, or maybe just natural consequences. But Donald Trump has been referring to the coronavirus as a hoax cooked up by the Democrats to take him down from the beginning. There are videos of him saying, you know, we're at five and by next week we'll be at three and then it'll just go away. We'll be done with this by Easter. I don't know if you remember. And refusing to wear a mask. And including the first presidential debate this election cycle, he was making fun of Joe Biden for wearing a mask. So it is something that that guy is the guy who got coronavirus. Again, call it karma, call it ironic, call it whatever you want, but it is a natural consequence of the behavior and the attitudes that he exhibited about it. So here I am and I'm like, I don't know if it's true or not or whatever. And in spite of me recognizing openly that it is karma, it is ironic, it is one of those things. But the other thought that I had was I'm certainly not someone who was hoping he would fall ill. I was not hoping he would pass away. But here was my hope. I was hoping that he would come out of this experience with compassion. I was hoping he would come out of this experience and like make a public statement, give a speech saying, wow, that was really rough, rougher than I anticipated, rougher than I thought. Everyone, we need to be more careful. Everyone, we need to be more aware and, and have some sort of message, language, verbiage of compassion. When he got out of the hospital, the first statement he made, I was like, oh my gosh, how is this leadership? What is this doing to the tone of the community in which you are in a position to lead? Because the statement he actually released basically said, I'm tougher than the coronavirus. Look how much I beat this coronavirus. We all need to just go back and live business as usual as if this is the flu, God bless America. And I was just like, people are literally going to die by following his suggestions. Like, do you remember when he, when he was talking about the Clorox bleach? People died because they injected Clorox bleach into their body because the president of the United States said so. And I think as I was watching this, I was, I was thinking about leadership and I was thinking about solution-focused brief therapy, actually. And I'm gonna say in a second, the important lesson here is to learn about solution-focused brief therapy, but I'm interested in that. And what was it like for you to come back to the world, like Adam was like totally disconnected from Wi-Fi. I'm trying to get a hold of Adam and it doesn't even ring. It just goes straight to voicemail. So I know he is checked out. What was it like for you, Adam, when you came back and discovered this craziness that had happened? On the one hand, right, it's almost like a two-sided reaction. On the one hand, there's obviously that initial shock, right, of I can't believe that somebody who, in essence, walks around in a bubble has gotten this. But on the other hand, there's that side where it's like, of course this happened. All of the behavior that preceded this was 
culminating in this happening. And so it was kind of this interesting dichotomy of surprise on the one hand and complete confirmation of what I thought was going to happen on the other hand. I think one of the things that I would say too is like as I was trying to get caught back up and listen to the dialogue that's surrounding this, one of the things that I was reminded of is the divisiveness, right? That even in an instant, oftentimes when someone gets ill, the natural reaction is an outpouring of love, an outpouring of support. And there was some of that. But on the other hand, there was also just jeering and there was hatred and there was a wishing of ill will. And so it just was a reminder that sometimes he's on the side of dishing out that hatred and that vile mess. And sometimes he's on the receiving end of all of that. And whether or not you think it's warranted or not, I think it behooves us to just take a step back and to say, is that really the kind of people we are? Is that the kind of country that we have become? And so there was, again, kind of just that dichotomy of this is the state of affairs here. And then you kind of mentioned leadership a couple of times. And one of the things that I started thinking about is as the leader of this country or the person who is in the position to be the leader of this country. I had a conversation with one of my friends recently and we were talking about our church actually and steps that the church is taking to maneuver through this process, right? And as they think about getting people back into the church, what steps are they taking and are they adequate steps and those kinds of things. And one of the things that my friend said in this conversation is in some sense, it doesn't matter what your political beliefs are. When it comes to this virus, whether or not you think it's real, whether or not you think that it is harmful, whether or not you think that people should just get back to the routine and we just need to get to a place of herd immunization, no matter which tactic you take, an organization like a church needs to, in some sense, go to the people who are the most vulnerable. And they need to put precautions in place, they need to put procedures in place that cater to the most vulnerable. And if they do that, if they cater to the most vulnerable people, whether that's physically vulnerable, whether that's emotionally vulnerable, whether that's spiritually vulnerable, whatever it is, if we put policies and procedures in place to alleviate or minimize risk, then we have protected as many people as possible. But if we go to a place of satisfying or appeasing the people who have the least risk, we put a lot of other people at risk. And so that's, as I was thinking about that statement, I was thinking about Trump's leadership throughout this process. And I can't really think of a time where he has gone to enacting policies or procedures for the most vulnerable people. It regularly seems like he's putting policies and procedures in place for the people who are at least at risk. I think that true leadership really gets at how do I try to get to the most vulnerable and protect them and by so doing, protect everyone else? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So like I said in a second, I'm going to talk about like why this matters in the context of our work as solution-focused professionals. But you mentioned hatred and so much of his leadership to that most vulnerable type of person is based on hatred. And it was, it was so hard to watch the hatred spewing online because I experience it as tremendously hypocritical. Because mm-hmm. I can remember, you know, four and a half years ago when Barack Obama was president, I remember the hatred towards Barack Obama. I've got the same Facebook friends I had now, right? Like the people I went to college with, they're the same people I went to college with now as they were then. When Barack Obama came to Texas, uh, he gave a speech about veterans. And this woman that I went to grad school with um, said, I just want to slap the F out of him. And she went on to say like horrible things. Like I wish someone would kill him and he needs to be out. She said horrible things. And I contacted the person and I was like, Hey man, like that's a human, that's someone's dad. Like that's someone's son. That's someone's husband. 
And whether you agree with him or not, he holds the highest office in the land. So I don't know if these things are appropriate. But you got mad at me and told me, like, you know, you're wrong and you're a leftist and you're probably a socialist and all these crazy things. And I was like, man, whatever. So then you fast forward some time. And now Donald Trump and and this person is very pro Donald Trump. You fast forward some time and Donald Trump is ill. That person is now posting how sick and twisted human beings are to wish ill on someone else. And I was like, do you forget that you were wishing ill on someone else? Like just two seconds ago, part of Donald Trump's leadership has been to stoke hatred. And a natural consequence of that is, so now it's like, now hatred is out. Like you let hatred out. So now it's out. Now you let it out and you pointed it at this thing. And now that you're the person feeling ill, it's a natural experience that the hatred comes back. Because it's out, like it's out flying around. So so now that you're the person in this position, so you shouldn't be surprised that hatred is coming back. Now, I'm not in any way insinuating that hatred should be good, but I am saying when you start talking the way he has talked, it eventually ends up flowing both ways. I wish I could open the mind of a Trump supporter just to be like, what the hell is wrong with you? Don't you see the hypocrisy present? Because not too long ago, you were saying very bad things about Barack Obama. And if anybody wants to know why Black people are uncomfortable in America today, it's because we know that if Barack Obama were president and got Ebola, because Ebola was something that was a problem back when Obama was president, y'all asses would have been saying very hurtful things about Barack Obama. So now that Donald Trump is the one who's ill, you think you get to sit on the high horse of righteousness talking about how like how everybody's sick and twisted because we're wishing ill on Donald Trump, which I have never wished ill on Donald Trump or anybody else for that matter. But watching people sit on this high horse of righteousness, like how could people be so awful to wish ill on him? Well, because you wished ill on other people. Like you can't do that. Like you can't make that claim. It's not fair. What you should do is if you don't like when people use hate, then you shouldn't like when Donald Trump uses hate. It doesn't just work when people are using hatred towards Donald Trump. It also works when hate is flowing out of Donald Trump's mouth. So if you were silent when Donald Trump was spewing hate, then you need to shut the hell up now when hatred is flowing back at Donald Trump. That level of hypocrisy is exactly why people like me feel unsafe in this country. I think you're right. And I think I think you're getting at that point, right? This point in history, because of the kind of leadership that has been in place for the last three and a half years, the most vulnerable people at this point, and arguably before this point, but particularly at this point, are people of color, right? People who are minorities. And so I think one of the characteristics of really good leaders are they're people who have developed relationships, meaningful relationships with everyone that they lead. Now, obviously, as the president of a country, you can't create a meaningful relationship with every single person in the country, but you can create meaningful relationships with groups of people, right? With people of color, with people that have disabilities, with women, with veterans, and you can develop those meaningful relationships. And in some sense, leadership is about accomplishing goals of an organization, of a country, whatever, through human activity, right? It's coalescing people together to accomplish things, to move things along, to make progress. And if you have meaningful relationships, the people that you can pull together are vastly different from one another. And therefore you can move monumental things that unless all of those different kinds of people come together, you can't move. And I think in some sense, Donald Trump has not tried to coalesce people together, but has consciously tried to divide people. You now see Congress spinning wheels, right? You now see humans spitting hatred back and forth at each other. You see now Supreme Court justices coming out pre-trials to say, this is the stance we'll take. Not even pre-trial, Adam. Sands trial. Like the pre-trial implies there is a trial and they were, there is no trial at the moment. They're just saying, if there were to be one, here's how we would decide. Yes. And all of that, I think you can trace back to not coalescing people, not bringing people together, but dividing people. And anytime we make it easier to point at somebody else and say, you're an other, you're a them, you're not like me, that 
stymies progress, that stymies unity. And I think a leader sets the tone for either unity or discontent. All right. So you just brought up the context of tone setting. And I've been saying like, there's a very important solution focused lesson in all the things that have been taking place here. And that lesson is actually about tone because like your attitude impacts a conversation. I think we see that on a macro scale with Donald Trump, like his attitude has impacted the environment that we currently find ourselves in, in the United States. Do you want to know why I feel unsafe? I feel unsafe because the attitude in the U.S. has shifted to the point where, and you just brought up such an important idea, like this idea of like othering. When I go to the grocery store, I look like one of them. Like there are people who view me as a them. And it has drastically made me feel less safe. So like when you go into a conversation, like let's bring that macro idea down to the micro. Like when you go into a conversation with another person or in the context of our work, a client, the attitude, the environment in the room is actually your responsibility. So I have to make sure that the attitude I bring into the room is one of hope, optimism, care, compassion, kindness, determination, belief in people, belief in me, confidence in the client, confidence in me, because those are all attitudes that foster an environment that leads towards growth. Those are the type of things that leads towards someone progressing. And you said like a good leader brings together things to accomplish a goal. In solution-focused therapy, the goal is to help the client achieve something. It's my job to recognize my role in that context. Adam, one of the things, if you were to ask me, and by the way, I'm about to say something critical about Donald Trump, and I'm doing it in the spirit that you can criticize, like no one is perfect. So here's my biggest criticism. If you were to ask me what I think Donald Trump is getting wrong, I would say he doesn't understand his role. I would say he doesn't understand his role in relationship to he's been a real estate celebrity and a reality television celebrity for so long. I don't think he understands the role of president requires a different level of activity. And he's, he's running the role of president as if he were still a reality TV celebrity. Mm -hmm. And that's an important thing to voice here, because I think a lot of times, Adam, people will ask us questions about how to do solution focused brief therapy. And they will say something like, so I tried this approach and it didn't work. Or I tried the best hopes question and it didn't work. Or what do you do when kind of questions? And oftentimes my answer is you are applying solution focused brief therapy as if it's a technique. And because the technique didn't work, you're now coming back to someone like me or someone like Adam and you're saying things like it didn't work. But it's actually not the technique that didn't work. It's just I don't think you understood your role in the session. Because our role in the session is co-constructive collaborators towards a client's desired outcome. My job is not to fix them. My job is not to lecture them. My job is not to punish them. My job is not to do it for them. My job is to co-construct a preferred future that contains the client's desired outcome in a conversation. That is my role. And I think if you can go into a solution-focused conversation and understand your role, you can do a better job as a solution-focused therapist. And I know of people that are like, I wish Donald Trump would be a better president and I wish Donald Trump would be a better whatever. And I told you, when he got coronavirus, my one hope was, I hope he comes out of this with a different message. Because I think that would be him understanding his role as the community leader in the United States. And what he said when he came out of the hospital, I don't think was congruent to being a leader who understands their role is connected to like attitude and what he could have said, I think would have been much more impactful. You just hit on something so important. And I think understanding what is within our role and understanding what is outside of our role is so critical to what we do as psychotherapists. I think it's the same across any role that we have, right? I think we were kind of talking about it because my daughter, my oldest daughter had a birthday and she is smack dab in the middle of her teen years. She's just turned 16 years old. And what my role is as a father, it changes over time, right? When she was three, when she was five, I had a much more directive role. I had a much more 
teaching, education, discipline role. Now that she's 16, my role shifts to loosening the reins a bit, which believe me is very difficult to do. It's now trusting her, seeing how she puts into action the principles that we've tried to teach her. If I held on to the role of a five-year-old dad with a 16-year-old, that's when you get somebody pushing back and saying, why don't you trust me? Why don't you believe me? Why don't you let me do anything that I want to do, right? We're in a relationship of contention instead of a relationship of growth, a relationship of trust. So if I can understand my role in psychotherapy, like you were mentioning, right? As a solution-focused brief therapist, my most important job is actually the same job as my job as a parent of a 16-year-old, and it is trust. It is saying to these clients, I won't try to take over for you. I won't try to provide psychoeducation to you. I won't try to compliment you a whole lot to build you up. What I will do is I will trust you. And sometimes trust looks like really hard questions that push people and they say, I don't know if I can answer these questions. And instead of backing off, you say, I trust you. Today, I was driving in the car with my daughter. She was driving. I was the passenger. That is probably one of the most scary things that has ever happened. But we were in the middle lane and there were cars merging into our lane from the right and she needed to merge over to the left. And because we live in Georgia, there was a massive pickup truck in the right lane, and we were merging to the right. She cut it very close. And it was all I could do not to be like, what are you doing? And it was all I could do not to grab anything possible to stabilize myself and be like, now we're gonna die. But if you react that way, you convey mistrust. So after she cut it very close, the truck actually then merged over to the left. And I said, how did you think that went? And she said, I've done better. (laughs) And I think in some sense, if I had freaked out, if I had yelled at her, she would have felt badly. She would maybe have cried. She would have been self-deprecating. But if I can hold it together in my role as a trusting father, then she can be open to her role as a learner. And she can reflect and say, I think I could have done that one a bit better. And I'm not setting myself up as a good leader in this situation, but I think good leaders understand their role and they understand that the people for which they lead, they also know their roles. They know when they do well. They know when they struggle. I don't need to to condemn them. We can simply have a conversation about it. What popped in my mind as you were talking, Adam, such an amazing story, knowing Rachel as I do, and knowing you as I do as a father, like what popped in my head as you were talking is like you have one of the most loving homes ever. Those of you who've been, you know, following me for a while and know me for a while, Adam is like my very, very best friend, but I might even have like a better best friend than Adam in his son, Toby. Toby is my guy. This kid is nice, warm, loving, and kind. And part of the reason he is all of those things is because he's grown up in a nice, warm, loving, and kind home. So to go back to this role of leadership and you hear Adam, like Adam understood his role of dad. So in this moment, it does not help Adam to freak out and cause extra angst and worry in Rachel as she is merging over. And he understood his role of dad. And he did something that must have been hard in that moment. Instead of going, what are you doing? You're going to kill us. He said, how do you think that went? Now, Adam, I guess the reason why I think environment and knowing your role is so important. If I introduced hatred into your home, you start using hateful words towards your wife, Becca, which by the way, if you know Adam, he would never do. But let's say I give Adam like hatred potion and he starts talking to Becca in hateful ways. The environment in the home would change and it would manifest itself in loving, warm, kind Toby getting into a fight at school. And if you guys know Toby right now, like 
the last thing in the world that would happen is Toby get into a fight at school. But once I introduce this type of dynamic in the home, then hate, like I said, it hates out there and it starts running around. Like Adam, how many times as a solution focused therapist working with families, the child is exhibiting difficult behaviors at school, but what happens through the therapy is the parents start getting along better and then the child's behavior gets better. Why is that? It's because environment matters. And the reason why Adam is so impressive to me as a dad is in the moment of almost death, he still knew environment matters. And he didn't talk to his daughter in a way that would trigger her to like go down a negative environment. And Adam, we are in a very significant position of leadership in the solution focused community. Like our organization does the most training. We impact the most people on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis with our training material. I currently have the biggest following in this field, and I am aware that environment matters. I want to inspire y'all so bad it hurts. So everything I create is about positivity and purpose and energy. I want to just fill your heart with inspiration so you can go do the very hard job of being a helping professional. You really have to be aware of that stuff when you're in a position of leadership. That matters on a macro level like my role in the Salute Folks community, Donald Trump's role in America, and it matters on a micro level, like my role when I'm sitting in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a client or when I'm sitting in a family session with a client. If I were working with like hateful Adam, who has a difficult relationship with his wife, hateful Becca, and they produce Toby going to school as like fighting Toby, I have a responsibility to that environment. And I just can't tell you how many times parents have come into my office and told me the litany list of all of the things wrong with their children because their children are going to school and they're skipping class and they're punching people and they're smoking in the boys' room kind of stuff. But then what the therapy actually accomplishes is not necessarily a change in the child or not even necessarily a change in the parents. It's the removal of hatred in the home, the implementation of hope, love, and kindness in the home. And then shockingly, the parent's relationship gets better, the child's behavior gets better, and they sustain itself. Like it gets better forever. Like it's not like a temporary, it's not like a temporary thing. It gets better like for ever. We have a responsibility to this environment and we have a responsibility to hold leaders accountable to what they're doing to this environment. And I don't care if you're a Trump supporter or not. But what I do care is you have to hold that man accountable. If he's gonna use hateful language towards a journalist who has a physical impairment, if he's gonna use hateful language towards Hispanics, if he's gonna use hateful language towards black people, then damn it, why can't you guys hold them accountable? Why can't you say we do not wanna live in a country where hate is running amok. We do not want to live in a country where we've allowed hate into the home. Because I'm telling you, the same thing would happen to America as what happens to these homes. If we can get hate out of America, America and the behaviors that are currently going on in America will change. Mm -hmm. But it's so incredibly frustrating that we seem to allow hate as long as you hate the same people I hate. The brilliance of Donald Trump is he hates the same people that his followers hate. So they follow him. And I'm shocked at the percentage of people that are willing to do that just because we don't know to call out hate when you hate the same people that I hate. And I will sit and tell you, I did not enjoy this past weekend when people were wishing ill upon Donald Trump because that's still hate. It's not a good thing, but it's also not good when you sit by and you let Donald Trump call all Mexicans rapists and criminals. It's not a good thing when you let Donald Trump say horrible things about all journalists are lying. Like you can't allow this anymore. Like we have to hold leaders accountable. If I, as the leader of the Sulu Focus community, if I start saying hateful things, hold me accountable. Like, it, you can't just hate for hate's sake. It's wrong. It's terrible. It's awful. And we have to start holding leaders accountable to doing a good job because it matters. Yeah, I think, I think you set up such a beautiful contrast, actually. You spent a time talking about the debilitating effect that hate has. But before that, you also spent time talking about the value and the importance of inspiring. And you say leaders are responsible to inspire. You as the leader of Solution Focus Brief Therapy, your job, your role is to inspire people who want to work from a solution focused place. The president of the United States should inspire Americans. And I would go further and say should inspire global citizens. And I think we as individual clinicians 
should be in the role of inspiring our clients. And from a solution-focused perspective, we inspire our clients by asking them inspirational questions. And when they hear themselves answer those inspirational questions, then they feel inspired. And I think inspiration in large degree is the antidote of hatred. Inspiration, when we feel inspired, we don't look at somebody else and say, you're less than me. When we feel inspired, we don't look at somebody else and say, you aren't worth anything. When we feel inspired, we look at other people and we feel like we should inspire them. We look at other people and we feel inspired by them. And good leaders understand the role of inspiration. They understand my job within my realm is to inspire the people with inside that circle. We have to do better as solution-focused brief therapists. We have to do better as family members. We have to do better as national citizens. And we have to do better as global citizens. We have to be inspirational to one another, not full of hatred. Adam, I think that that is epically important, that we understand that good leaders inspire, good leaders good leaders provide hope. And I wish that there could be a shift in this world. Like one of the things that I experience is tremendously triggering is when people say, I don't agree with everything he says, but I like his policies. Because what that does is it diminishes the importance of what he says, because what he says matters. And I find it so incredible, right? Like that we are more tolerant of the leader of the United States of America than we are of the people who lead our athletic teams. One of the other things that happened this weekend is there's a football team called the Atlanta Falcons. And the Atlanta Falcons had a coach. His name was Bill O'Brien. And he had multiple arguments with players on the team. He said some inappropriate things. He made some ill-timed decisions. And four weeks into the season, he was fired. And I'm not saying he shouldn't have been fired. I mean, I don't know the dude, and I don't, I, whatever, but we are not tolerant. And, and fans all over Twitter were like, good riddance. We've been wanting him to be fired for a really long time. There was a Cincinnati Reds announcer who didn't realize his microphone was on, and he used a gay slur, and he lost his job immediately. They literally removed him from the broadcast in the middle of the game. The next day, he made a statement of apology saying that he needed to take some time away to allow for healing. And a week later, the Cincinnati Reds said he will not come back ever. And I think that that's an appropriate response when you say hurtful things. Donald Trump has been saying hurtful things for a really long time. And I have to sit here and hear people say, I don't agree with everything he says, but no buts. What people say matters. I am in a significant position of leadership in the field of solution-focused brief therapy. Like I just said, the largest following in our field. If I were to use a gay slur, if I were to use a racial slur, if I were to say something hurtful against one religious group, against one ethnic group, against one nationality, I promise you people would stop following me. I would be canceled. I don't understand why we make excuses for the leader. I mean, I, when I was growing up, we used to refer to the president of the United States as the leader of the free world. And I don't understand why we make excuses for someone holding that position who says hurtful things. Now, again, I'm not necessarily calling for his firing because you know what's funny, Adam? If we had held him accountable while he was running four and a half years ago, I'm not saying like maybe he would have lost and we wouldn't be in this position. I'm saying maybe he would have changed and he would have been a better leader. Maybe he would have said, oh, the United States populace will not tolerate this. So if I want to become president, if I want to become commander in chief, I probably need to change my rhetoric. And I don't care if Donald Trump is president or not. I care about what we've done here as a society. We've allowed it. We have an election coming up. He's going to win. He's going to lose, whatever. But we're still the same country that allowed it. And at some point, we have to look ourselves in the mirror and say, like, we have to say leaders cannot be hateful. And I wish to God that like, when all of this stuff started, when the debates were going back in 2015 and 2016 and presidential campaigns were running, we should have communicated. You can run for president if you want, but hate's not allowed here. We don't do hate. If there's any country in the world that knows the impact and power and negative things that hate can do, America should be that country. We have experienced hate on a level. How many times do we have to sit down and let the lecturer of time teach us 
hate doesn't work. And I think regardless of who wins in this upcoming election, we have to say to ourselves, hate is no longer allowed here. So the next politician who starts saying, I'm running on a platform of hatred of Mexicans, so I'm going to build a wall. I'm running on a platform of hatred of Muslims, so I'm not letting them in. I'm running on a platform of hatred of mask wearers, so I'm going to make fun of them. Think about this for a second. We hate mask wearers. That's how like fluently Americans speak hate language. We hate mask wearers. How insane is this? This upcoming election, I'm just like everybody else. I think it's really important. And I think we need to vote and we need to vote and we need to vote. But regardless of who wins, we also need to ask ourselves, how did we get here? And we need to say, what do we need to do to make sure we never allow hate into our house again? Anytime we allow hatred of, of anyone, we all become less. And we can't afford for an entire country and an entire world to become less. We simply cannot afford that. We have to be better. I won't spew hate out into the world. I'm going to do everything I can to inspire and spread hope, love, energy, positivity. And I also want my relationship with Adam to be an example. Every opportunity I have to view Adam as one of them is present. He is white. He is from an affluent background. He is in a, in a religious group that is not particularly majority. Every opportunity for me to say, like, I can't trust him or he is one of those people. Adam and I, if you just, like, read the autobiography of Elliot Connie and the autobiography of Adam Frower, in every box, we are not the same. But somehow... He is the closest person to me. I adore the man. And I would like you guys to start asking yourselves, like, how did Elliot and Adam do that? How did they see past all of the differences and all of the systems that hold us out as different? And how did they build the relationship they built? Because the relationship we built, it impacts every area of our lives. It has impacted our professional lives. It has impacted our personal lives. It has impacted our familial lives. Like there is no part of our lives untouched based upon this relationship. And I think you guys should start asking yourselves, you guys listening to this podcast, how come two people so different, where there are systems in place to hold them out as different, how have they built beauty? You're spot on. And it isn't just large, you know, systems that have promoted that we shouldn't be friends and we shouldn't be colleagues and we shouldn't get along with one another. Very specific people have deliberately tried to put a wedge in between or to seed mistrust. And I think one of the things that has kept us close, that has kept our relationship strong, is what good leaders do. And it is, again, going back to trust, right? Any time there has been an opportunity to mistrust, we have come to each other and we have said, hey, what do you make of this? Or what do you think about this? Or how do you think you would manage this? And I think that continual turning toward one another, that continual putting trust in each other has made us realize we have so much more in common and we have so many more common interests and common ventures than superficial differences. And I think if people just could take the time to turn toward each other, to get to know each other, to offer a little bit of trust, seeming differences get erased quickly. Look, man, I love you, bro. And I love you because we were able to do that. And now we're, you know, 12 years into our friendship or whatever. And I, and I can't tell you there's not an area of my life that this relationship has not touched. But I realize now that like, it wasn't magic, like we earned it. Yeah. And we earned it by doing exactly what you just said. So what we did was we saw through the differences and got to know each other like in each other's hearts. We saw through the differences and found similarities because like I said, only the boxes are different. But if you look into Adam's heart, it's very similar to mine. That's what I want you guys to discover. So every time we end this podcast, we always end it by saying, Here's a challenge to you. Here's what we want you guys to do differently. And you know what I would love for you guys to do differently? Walk through your world. Get on the train, get on the bus, wear your mask, by the way. Go for your walk. And when you interact with people who are a different gender than you, a different sexual preference than you, a different religion than you, a different skin tone than you, different ethnicity than you, different nationality than you, different socioeconomic status than you, I want you to look into their hearts and, and experience them as people. 
and discover what we have in common. Because what we have in common is much more powerful than what difference we have. And Adam and I serve as your living example of that truth. Absolutely. Yeah. And I couldn't be more grateful for somebody who seems so different, but really is exactly the person that I would ask to be by my side. Same. I couldn't do what I'm doing without you by my side. Like it just, it just wouldn't have happened. And I mean that professionally, like I've reached heights that I never thought I would reach, but I also mean that personally because my life is richer. I mean, my life is richer because Toby's in it. Uh, my, my life is richer because Rachel is in it. Your daughter, Juju, may have paid me the greatest compliment ever. And I will never forget this. Just, so guys, I want you to understand what I mean. Fill your hearts with love. Adam's daughter, Julia, affectionately referred to as Juju or the Juge, but she only lets people close to her call her Juju. So when Adam and I were like kind of getting close and crossing this line from like professional to like true proper friends, he said to Julia, what would you like Elliot to call you? And she said, Juju. And it was like a sign of acceptance almost from this, this little creature. Um, and when I say little, she is tiny. It was like this sign of like acceptance. And now when I go to her house, she doesn't like run off in the corner and hide because she's shy. She asked me to hold my hand up and she tries to jump up and hit my hand. Now I can't tell you the amount of joy I experienced from watching that little tiny person jump up and like hit my elbow as she's trying to hit my hand. But I know that's because there's love present. And that's because all of this happened because Adam and I decided to view each other's hearts and to look for the similarities and not the differences. And I can't tell you the impact it will have on your life if you do what I'm asking you to do. If you just start looking at people for their hearts and what makes them the same as you, it will transform everything in your life. I just cannot explain it. A lot of you, and I'm going to end by saying this, a lot of you experience 2020 as a nightmare year. I do as well. Uh, 2020 is, you know, there's certainly been nightmarish things that 2020 has brought into my life. But even now, as we're approaching the end of 2020, when I look back on 2020, 2020 is the year my dreams come true. 2020 is the year that Adam and I both commit. We got rid of distractions and we now work together full time. We have been talking about this since we took a weird walk in Malmo, Sweden a decade ago. So will I remember the nightmare that 2020 was, the COVID-19 and the inconsistent you know, work opportunities and, and the deaths of celebrities and inspirational public figures? Of course I will. But what trumps all of that is 2020 is also the year that my dreams came true. And my best friend is now my business partner. And we wake up every day call each other and like, what awesome work thing are we going to be doing today? I'm telling you guys, if you can go out in your life and find that different person that compliments you, the problem we have in this society more than, more than anything, I think, is we look for similar people so we can experience comfort. But similarities don't complement. Like peanut butter and jelly have to be different to complement. You know what I'm saying? Like, and you can't find your compliment unless you find beauty in difference because Adam is the jelly. You know what I mean? Like you have to go out and find difference because that's the only way to find the complimenting piece. So my lasting closing message is find beauty in difference because that's the only way to find your complimenting piece. And one of the things in my life that I'm most proud of is I get to be Adam's complimenting piece and I get to experience the benefit of him being mine. Absolutely agree. Couldn't say it any better. So people, go out and find beauty in difference. Thank you for listening. Thank you.